Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law. Hope you're having a great day. And for today's story, we're dealing with qualified immunity, a doctrine that we have deeply questioned on this channel. There have been a lot of times when police or other government officials have done things that seem really, really wrong. And then courts dismiss the qualified immunity complaint when someone raises it and says, I'd like to be compensated for this really, really wrong thing, please. The courts then turn around and dismiss it and say, well, there's not a clearly established case. That can be really, really frustrating. But today's case isn't like that. This isn't one of those situations where the police seem to have done something deeply wrong. In fact, in this particular situation, it seems the police did something very, very right. And for some reason, the Ninth Circuit seems to be struggling with this when this is actually like a really, really easy case to decide in favor of the officer. So we're going to read the perhaps unusual circumstance, at least for this channel, where the officer is completely in the right, but the court is still asking qualified immunity case questions anyway. Let's get started with that. The following facts are undisputed. On December the 24th of 2015, Martha Andrade, the mother of Omar's children, called 911 and reported that Omar had hit Andrade and his mother, plaintiff Ventura, and smashed Andre's vehicle window. So yeah, Omar over here is basically committing domestic violence and she's reporting it to the police, okay? Then while the officer was in viewing, was interviewing Andre about all this, Omar started walking up to the street towards the home. So the, the police officer is interviewing the, the domestic violence you know, victim and asking questions. And then Omar starts walking up the street towards the police officer and the domestic violence victim. Okay. Andre identified Omar to the officer, pointing to him and saying, that's him. Okay. The officer issued several orders for Omar to stop. Despite these orders, Omar continued to advance towards Andre and took out a knife from his pocket. The, the, domestic, the domestic violence bad guy is now advancing on the officers and the domestic violence victim and has now drawn a knife as he advances towards them. Okay. Continuing to approach Andre with knife in hand, Omar asked, is this what you wanted? This seems like a threat to me. Officer Rutledge then shouted a warning to Omar to shot, stop or I'll shoot. When Omar did not stop, which is to say he continued advancing with the knife in hand, Rutledge fired two shots and the shots killed Omar. Well, you know, we've, we, as I mentioned, we cover a lot of qualified immunity cases and a lot of cases where the officer's conduct is questionable, if not outright abhorrent. But this seems super duper easy, super easy, barely an inconvenience. What happened in this particular situation? The officer was called to a scene of potential domestic violence. The officer is interviewing the person who was who was the violence was committed against. As they're interviewing this person, the person who committed the domestic violence is now approaching the officer and the domestic violence victim. He then pulls out a knife and the officer says, please stop, please stop. And he doesn't. And the officer shoots them. This seems, this seems pretty clear. This seems pretty clean. There seems to be uh, pretty good grounds for the officer to use deadly force in this situation. One would think this should be rock solid easy, but the ninth circuit seems like they're going to struggle with it for a little while for some reason. Qualified immunity attaches when an officer's conduct does not violate clearly established statutory or constitutional rights of which a reasonable person would have known. And then clearly established law, which is the part that we always trip up on on these cases, exists when the contours of a right are sufficiently clear that every reasonable officer would have understood what she is doing violates the right. Okay, well, yeah, for, we have to have two things for there to be a qualified immunity complaint lawsuit. First of all, you have to violate someone's rights and then the way you violate it has to be sufficiently clear. I'm having trouble getting past step one. The, the officer has fired the firearm in response to the bad guy or purported bad guy advancing on the victim and the officer with knife in hand. This is the reason the officer fired. This does not strike me as a violation of the Constitution. It strikes me as well within the bounds of the Constitution and also just personal defense. But for some reason, the Ninth Circuit is not so sure. The undisputed facts establish that the officer was responding to a violent domestic disturbance, you know, with breaking of cars and all kinds of things, yes, where Andre had called 911 to report that Omar had hit her and the mother and had smashed the window of the car. 
seems like a violent domestic violence, violent disturbance to me, yes, that Omar was approaching Andre with knife drawn, which seems like enough right there. Omar continued his advances while ignoring multiple commands to stop any warning that they would shoot. And Omar had advanced to within 10 to 15 of Andre when they fired. Seems like a pretty clean shoot to me. We also find that no intervening case gave Officer Rutledge notice that her actions would violate clearly established law. Like, how is that even possible? The cases Ventura cites are distinguishable in ways. So there are, there are other cases with police misuse of force, as to be sure. And so we'll distinguish from those other cases like we actually have to for some reason. In Glenn versus Washington County, the decedent, the person who died, had not previously attempted to hurt anyone and not moved towards anyone else until being shot with a bing bang gun. So in this other prior case, this, this person had not previously attempted to hurt anybody and they were not moving. They were just standing around basically and the police fired on them anyway. That seems like that might be a problem. But here the guy was advancing on them with knife in hand. So that seems pretty materially different, yes. In the other case, an officer had shot at a teenager who was walking with a toy gun, which looked like an AK-47. The teenager was not suspected of a crime and was shot when he turned in response to a single order to drop a gun that came from behind. So again, that seems a bit materially different. He was walking with a toy gun, but one that looked like an AK-47. And there was only one warning. And so maybe that would be a problem. But again, that is quite different from the facts here. He, he actually did have a knife. He, he was advancing. There were mobile warnings. This is, this is not hard. The degrees of apparent danger in these cases that we just discussed does not squarely govern with the facts here. That's a very strange way to phrase that, you know? To say that, to say that something does not squarely govern means that they're not on the same, they're not exactly the same, right? But these cases are completely different. Like sometimes the court says essentially in so many words, um, is this a square? Is this a rec is this a is this a rectangle? Is it is it uh is it a uh is it a quadrilateral? Has one of the edges been shone off? You know, we're not quite sure if this is a square or not because of all these things. But here the court is saying, is this circle a square? This is very weird. This is nothing like a square. It's not even close to a square. It's a circle, man. Why are you asking these questions? This is strange. Omar was in fact advancing with a knife towards a woman who he had reportedly just assaulted. And because assault, as you may know, is the apprehension of fear, was at that moment committing another assault at that moment because he was advancing with a knife. Assault is apprehension of, of the fear. So that means it's a brand new assault. Okay. He ignored officers Rutledge's repeated commands to stop and a warning that they would shoot. None of the cases Ventura cites involves an officer acting under similar circumstances. And therefore Ventura fails to show that it was clearly established the actions amounts to a constitutional excess of force which how's that even possible? They were advancing with a knife in real time on the officer who gave multiple different warnings. How is it possible that that's excessive force? I don't know. And then the court says that they're entitled to qualified immunity after thinking about it with, for a little bit for some reason. Thus, that brings us to the end of the case of Maria Ventura versus the city of Porterville. In this case, Omar did some bad things. He, he apparently committed, committed domestic violence or at least it was reported that he did. And then as the officer was interviewing the purported victim, Omar over here decides it's a good idea to advance on the police officer who's interviewing the domestic violence suspect with knife in hand. And the police officer says, please stop. And he doesn't and then shoots him. And the Ninth Circuit goes through this very complicated analysis of like, this isn't squarely on point with any other case that says this is bad, but it's, it's, it's normal routine police behavior. For that matter, we don't even need to talk about police. We could just talk about self-defense theory, period. They're advancing on you with a knife. It's easy. It's self-defense or defense of others. Take your pick, you know, but either way, it's pretty easy. But the Ninth Circuit actually has to think about it for a minute about whether or not the officer violated the Constitution, which I don't even know how that's possible unless they think self-defense is inherently bad, which probably is something they think. But this is one where the officer clearly wins a qualified immunity case, and we don't even have, really have to think about it, for, but the Ninth Circuit does for some reason, and that brings us to the end of the discussion of this case.